Welcome everyone. This is the first edition of this International Philosophy Book Club uh, under the, you know, the COVID-19 era. Uh, the book for today, as I assume you know, um, although of course there's no requirement to actually read the book, um, is Bohish's The Constellation of Philosophy, which is a classic of Western literature. Before we get there, uh, let me uh, tell you a couple of sort of preliminary things. First of all, my name, your, your host is Massimo Piliucci. Uh, I am a professor of philosophy at the City College of uh, New York. And uh, this is the first of a series of book clubs that I'm going to host over the next several months. You know, it's kind of an open-ended project. We'll see how it goes. Um, if you are a member of the meetup, which you probably are if you are actually RSVP for this um, for this event and got the link to participate, uh, feel free to uh, suggest books uh, by contacting me via uh, meetup. Uh, there's no guarantee, of course, that I'll pick that particular one that you suggested, but uh, suggestions are welcome. And speaking of future books, before we get to Boishas today, uh, the next uh, episode of this, this philosophy book club is going to, or the next edition, I should say, is going to take place on Wednesday, June 3rd at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And we will discuss Albert Camus, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. And we'll have two special guests, my friends, Sky Cleary and Jamie Lombardi, both of whom are existential philosophers, have written about Camus. And so it should be kind of a fun, uh, fun thing. I thought about discussing the plague, but that was so obvious. Uh, everybody's reading Camus, The Plague, and so I figured now we'll do something different this time. The myth of, of Sisyphus is, a, is an interesting one. It's also non, non-fiction, just as Bush's uh, Constellation of Philosophy. Uh, eventually, in July, we're going to get to the, our first fiction book, which is going to be Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, which is the first modern, often considered the first modern uh, science fiction story, basically, and it's got a lot of interesting sort of implications in terms of, you know, ethics and uh, the role of science in society and that sort of stuff. But today we're going to talk about Boishas. So uh, here's how it's going to work. Uh, we're going to be in this um, uh, in this uh, conversation for up to 90 minutes, if we need to. If we uh, wrap it up earlier, it's not a problem. And the way I figured I would, I would do it is this. I'm going to give you, first of all, a brief introduction, very brief introduction about you know, the Constellation, you know, it's the, the background. And then I'm going to actually go book by book. The Constellation is made of five books or chapters, as we will call them today. And I'm going to read some highlights, not many, just a few highlights and make a few comments from each one of these books. And then I'm going to pause after each chapter and I will open up. Uh, for discussion, for Q&A. And then when we wrap that part up, uh, or either, either because it happens naturally or because I think that we've got enough comments on that particular chapter, then we move on uh, to the second chapter and hopefully we'll cover everything, the entire, the entire book within the 90 minutes uh, allotted, okay? So when you want to ask a question or make a comment, raise your virtual hand um, and uh, I will call on you on, uh, in the order in which I see you, I will unmute your your, your microphone and um, and we'll go from there. So the constellation of philosophy, uh, not to be confused with the constellations plural of philosophy, which is a modern book by uh, public philosopher uh, Alain de Botton, was written about in around the year 524. This is essentially at the end, at the very end of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is actually the Western Roman Empire has collapsed by this point. Um, and even though the last emperor was actually still alive, but it was about to be deposed. It has been described, the book has been described as the single most influential work in the West on medieval and early Renaissance Christianity. And at the same time, it's also been described as the last great Western work of the classical period. So it really does bridge uh, the end of the classical period. You know, a lot of the influence, uh, as we'll see that, um, uh, that is reflected in Bush's is comes from the Stoics, for instance, and Bush himself was a Neoplatonist, but he also was a Christian, so he writes also within the, the, the early Christian period uh, tradition. Bush wrote, wrote uh, the book during a one year imprisonment uh, that he served while he was awaiting trial and eventual execution for the alleged crime of treason. Uh, he was serving under the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great. 
And until very recently, before he started writing, uh, you know, before he was arrested and started writing Consolation, Mauritius had been actually at the height of power in Rome, he holding the prestigious office of Magisterium Officiorum, and, and therefore presiding as a member of the Senate. He was brought down by envy and treachery, uh, as he himself explains actually in the book, in the first, uh, in the first uh, chapter of the book. Now, that's the ex experience, of course, that uh, inspired the text, uh, which is now part of a tradition called uh, prison uh, uh, literature, because it was written in prison, obviously. Um, the text itself re reflects on how, of course, it's a reflection on how evil can exist in a world governed by God. That's the, what Christians call the problem of theodicy. You know, how is it that there is evil in a, in a world in which God is supposed to be all-powerful, uh, all, all good and, and all knowing. And uh, Bushes also talks about how happiness is in fact still attainable or maybe still attainable uh, in the middle of you know, the fickle for fortune. The book is written as a conversation with philosophy. It alternates uh, between poetry and prose, although most of it is, is prose, but the poetry is actually beautiful, especially if you happen to be uh, able to read it in the original Latin, but even the, 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 the um, uh, English translation, at least the one that I had, um, that I chosen, I think it was the vintage edition, uh, was very good. Uh, so it's a conversation with Lady Philosophy. Philosophy is imagined as an actual, as a woman, um, and she comes uh, into Boish's cells and they start talking. Uh, during the conversation, philosophy contends that happiness comes from, with, from within, and that virtue is uh, all that one actually has, truly has because it is not uh, imperiled by the vicissitudes of fortune. This, uh, as we will talk about, is a classic stoic argument. Uh, that, it, in, that is that uh, the only thing that, that it's up to you is your own, your own virtue, and that is what makes you, if you focus on that, and then take the rest as it comes, uh, that attitude makes you essentially invincible, impervious to fortune. About justice, Lady Philosophy says that criminals are not to be abused, but rather treated with sympathy and respect. Um, uh, and in fact, she uses at some point an analogy between the doctor and a patient, in a, a patient and doctor relationship. That too is a clear influence from the Stoics, as we will uh, talk about a little later. As I mentioned, Boetius was a Neoplatonist, and um, he contends, he, he assumes that the truths found in Christianity are in fact no different from the truths found in philosophy. So he thinks that uh, it is, is one of a long tradition of Christian writers and actually Islamic writers and Jewish writers that think that you can get at the same truths either by philosophy, by way of philosophy, or by way of, way of scriptures. Interestingly, however, he never invokes Christian texts throughout the consolation. This is a work of philosophy. Uh, it, there is absolutely nothing, there's no, you know, God says so, the gospel say so, and so on and so forth. So as I mentioned already a couple of times, Boetius is, is definitely influenced by the Stoics, and particularly by Seneca, uh, who he, in fact he actually mentions uh, right at the beginning of the Consolation. Dante, uh, Boetius himself was very influential, as I said, Dante called them the blessed soul who exposed the deceptive world to anyone who gives ear, uh, ear to him. And uh, we find influences of Boetius throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and even in the treatment of evil in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Okay. So it's, it's actually fairly until, up until fairly, fairly recently. So um, right now, uh, then we're gonna actually, I'm gonna actually start reading you some of my highlighted passages. By the way, if you, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but um, if you did, didn't, then uh, you can do it after this. You can check it after this conversation. If you go to the meetup page for the book club, you will see a number of PDF documents, uh, each one of which contains a large set of, a fairly large set of highlights from each one of the five books of the Constellation. So if you want to go back later and download those and take a look, uh, it, it's, it's kind of my little cheat, cheat notes, essentially, for, for the book. I will do that for the next books as well. This is not to encourage people not to read the book, obviously, but you know, we're all busy and if people can't read the book or can't finish the book, then they can use the notes before coming into the meeting and uh, as a sort of a uh, quick overview. So I'm gonna start by reading and commenting briefly on some of my highlights, my favorite bits from book one of the Constellation of Philosophy, and then I'll open up for the first round of discussion. 
So in chapter one, uh, Boetius tells us that this lady who initially doesn't know what, who she is, comes into the room and he says, her eyes lit on the muses of poetry who were standing by my couch, furnishing words to articulate my grief. For a moment, she showed the irritation. She frowned and fire flashed from her eyes. Who, she asked, has allowed these harlots of the stage to approach this sick man? Not only do they afford no remedies to relieve his pains, but their succulent poisons intensify them. These ladies with their thorns of emotions choke the life from the fruitful harvest of reason. So this is interesting to me because it's, it's lady philosophy who tells to the muses of poetry to get the hell out of the, 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 the room because they're not helping. In fact, they're actually making things worse. This is a reflection of Plato's attitude toward poetry and, uh, and fiction. Right? Plato, uh, Plato famously in the, in, the, uh, in the Republic said that the poets would not be allowed. And the reason for that is because they make up stuff and they manipulate you, uh, you know, emotionally and they overcome your reason. And so they're not welcome in Plato's Republic. Apparently Boetius agreed. And so he prefers the consolation of philosophy to the consolation of literature and, and poetry. Whether we agree or not, that's of course a different issue. Uh, interesting, it's interesting to me, by the way, that both in the case of Boetius and Plato, there's an irony there because they're both writing literature. They're writing philosophical literature, but it is literature nonetheless. Uh, Plato writes dialogues. Those are fictional uh, things and, and of course, the entire consolation of philosophy is a dialogue, so it's fiction. Um, I mean, unless we assume that Lady Philosophy really did come in, in, inside Boish's room and this is an actual transcript. From chapter three, um, Lady Philosophy says, perhaps you have not learned of the flight of Anaxagoras, of the poison forced on Socrates, of the torturing of Zeno, for these took place abroad. But at any rate, you have been able to acquaint yourself with such figures as Canius and Seneca and Serenus, for the tradition about them is still fresh and famous. They were dragged down to disaster for no other reason than that they were schooled in my ways. So who are all these people? The first group, Anaxagoras um, and uh, of course Socrates and then Zeno, this is Zeno of Elia, not, not Zeno the Stoic, but the earliest Zeno, the one of the paradox. Um, all of these were actually either condemned to death or, um, or persecuted by political authorities. And so basically, uh, philosophy is, is saying to Boetius, you know, you're in good, you're good, you're in good company. You know, you're, you're doing here precisely what Zeno and Exagoras, uh, Socrates were doing. And then he, she says, you know, if you don't remember those guys, then surely you remember more recent examples. Canius, for instance, was accused of a plot against, uh, was a, a philosopher who was accused of a plot against Caligula. Seneca, of course, was uh, forced to commit suicide uh, by Nero because he was accused of being in a plot against Nero. And the last one, Serranus Barea, was also killed on the order of Nero. So all three of these actually uh, are associated with what is called the stoic opposition to imperial tyranny. So, you know, this is the first bit of consolation, basically, that comes out of philosophy. She says, look, at the very least, you're in good company here. Don't, don't think that, uh, that you're wasting you know, that your life is wasted. You're actually an example of a long tradition of philosophers opposing uh, tyranny or being brought down by envy. In uh, chapter four, she says, affairs of state would be blessed, blessed if students of philosophy directed them or if those who controlled them happened to be students of philosophy. This also comes straight of Plato, of course, right? So Plato in the Republic, concludes that the ideal state would have to be run by philosophers. Slightly self-serving since he was a philosopher, um, but um, um, he actually at least tried to do what he was, uh, you know, what he was preaching. Uh, after he left uh, uh, Athens, after the, left, uh, the, the, the death of Socrates, he actually went to Syracuse in Sicily and tried to teach the uh, tyrant there, Dionysus I, uh, philosophy and making him, making him into a philosopher king and uh, Plato almost got killed as a result and so he got out of Syracuse and eventually started wandering throughout the Mediterranean and went back to, to um, Athens where he established his famous academy but so this is the notion that um, you know philosophers would probably be by philosophers by the way of course here this is not meant professional philosophers as we understand today you know somebody who gets a PhD and, and goes to teach in a university we're talking people who understand and practice the philosophical life. Right? So anybody can be a philosopher. She's, she's not saying, or Boetius, 
is not saying that uh, you know only professional philosophers can, can uh, should run states. And of course, we have a few examples of actual philosopher kings. The most famous one, of, uh, from, uh, um, arguably, is Marcus Aurelius, who in fact was not a professional philosopher. He never taught philosophy, but he studied philosophy when it was when he was young. And then Stoicism, in particular, uh, stuck with him for the rest of his life, and he used it uh, as a guide for his governance. Finally, the last thing, the last bit that I want to read from uh, uh, the first book of the Consolation of Philosophy is this. Uh, this is now, so, so far we've seen, we've heard Lady Philosophy. Now it's back to Boetius. Boetius is saying, well, all of this is nice and, and, and good, but, and I quote, I see evildoers, one and all roused by their impunity to venture on wicked deeds and by rewards to see them through. I see innocent men deprived not only of safety, but also of the right to defend themselves. This is what steers my cry of lament. So what he's saying is, you know, what everybody would, would argue against philosophy here is like, yeah, 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 sure, this is great. I'm, I'm doing the same thing as Socrates and all that sort of stuff. But the, the reality is I see a lot of bad people that are actually apparently enjoying a pretty good life. So what about that, lady philosophy? What, are you, what do you have to say about that? And the book, the first book ends there. So um, let's see if there is any comments or questions uh, at this point, hopefully focused on not just on the bits that I read, but on the first book of the Consolation. And if not, we're going to go on. But I'm going to leave a second here for people to raise their virtual hand if they have comments uh, or questions. OK, we have one, and that's Jeff. So Jeff, hold on a second. I'm going to. Uh, Unmute you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Oh. Uh, hi. Um, hi, Josh. I, yeah, I read this book for, or actually the first two chapters for, for another meetup thing, and I really liked your, your description. I didn't realize that, that, that the Neo-Stoics were considered a sort of resistance to, to authority. So that, that actually is, uh, I, I, I think, thank you for that. That's, that, that, that helps a lot. Because I've got a lot of resistance to Stoicism per se. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Politically situated like that, for now. No, maybe not too, but to study at least. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yes, the the Stoics uh, that I'm referring to, where they're known as the Stoic opposition. Actually, there is a Wikipedia page on them, uh, and I wrote an essay uh, not long ago on my on my site about the Stoic opposition. This was a group of senators and philosophers who opposed three emperors, uh, Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian. And several of them, of course, lost their life as a, as a result of it. Others were sent in, into exile. One of them was, in fact, Epictetus, uh, the, one of the most famous Stoic philosophers. He was sent in exile um, by the emperor Domitian. And uh, that's, that's why he moved to, to northwestern Greece uh, in Nicopolis and reestablished this school there. And eventually that one became actually the most famous school of the, of the early first century, philosophy school of the early first century. Um, Epictetus' uh, teacher, Musonius Rufus, was sent into exile twice by Vespasian and by the missions or two, two different emperors. And uh, in fact, if you read the discourses uh, by Epictetus, there are a number of places where he mentions by name a number of people uh, of uh, Stoic philosophers who had been exiled uh, or killed as a, as a result uh, of, um, of their opposition to the emperors. Interestingly, it does not actually mention Seneca, although it's, it's very likely that the two met because Epictetus was at the court of Nero, uh, although he was very young when, uh, when Seneca was active. So. Um, the next uh, uh, comment or question is from Cora. Um, Cora, go ahead. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just a little puzzled uh, by section three of book one, where he seems to make um, some nasty comments about the uh, Epicureans and Stoics. Yeah. Can you can you read it to me? Because I sure. have the book, but, but yeah, if I yeah. find... You know, I thought it, I was I was amused. So he writes. Uh, so it's the first part of section three is verse, and then he goes into prose. After that, the mobs of Epicureans and Stoics and the others each did all they could to seize for themselves the inheritance of wisdom that he left. As part, yeah. of, their, as part of their plunder, they tried to carry me off. <laughs> wisdom talking, okay, but I fought and struggled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in the fight, the robe was torn, which I had 
woven with my own hands. They tore off little pieces from it and went away in the fond belief that they had obtained the whole of philosophy. The sight of, <laughs> this is terrible. The sight of traces of my clothing on them gained them the reputation among the ignorant of being my familiars. And as a result, many of them became corrupted by the ignorance of the uninitiated mob. I mean, that's pretty, pretty harsh. <laughs> it is pretty harsh. It's also a fairly vivid image, right? Of her, her clothes are being torn away by these philosophers are yeah. to, to take advantage of her. So, um, okay, let me <laughs> let me address this. Yeah, I noticed that part actually. Now that you mention it, it's kind of, it was kind of interesting, and it does contrast with several other bits where, on the other hand, she mentions positively uh, people like Seneca and um, and Epicurus. In fact, at some point, in a couple of places, uh, he mentions she mentions Epicurus. The way I interpret this is because even though Boethius was in fact somewhat eclectic in his philosophy. So as I said, he was influenced by a number of different philosophies, including Epicureanism, Stoicism, and of course, Christianity. But he fundamentally was a Neoplatonist. And so he thought of himself, of course, at the time, the Neoplatonists were not called Plat Neoplatonists, they were called Platonists. And uh, even though we recognize them as a later uh, version of the academy. And so, you know, he has uh, this attitude toward, you know, the people that came after Plato, or more specifically after Socrates are not, you know, are not real inheritors of the, of the tradition. Uh, the, the, you know, the real stuff is Socrates and therefore by implication Plato, everybody that came later, so they tried to, to do their best, but yeah, you know, they didn't quite succeed as, at the same level. Interestingly, the uh, Stoics themselves actually explicitly called themselves Socratics. Uh, the, the, the Stoic, they were called Stoics by others, and eventually they adopted their name. But initially, they called themselves either Zenonians, after the name of Zeno of Sagium, the founder, or simply Socratics. They, they, simply, they simply they thought of themselves as uh, direct uh, intellectual descendants of um, of Socrates. All right, guys, thank you for your uh, uh, comments, and uh, let me go back to the readings. So now we are moving to book two. And again, I have a few quotes from there, and then we'll reopen uh, discussion uh, about, about the book. So, from chapter one of book two, uh, Lady Philosophy says, you think that fortune has changed towards you, but you are mistaken. Her ways and her nature are always the same. When you have freely chosen her as your mistress, it would surely be inequitable if you attempted to lay down terms for her stay or her departure. So this is, Book one ends with Boethius saying, what the hell? There's lots of these people who are doing bad stuff and they're doing well. And you know, I'm, I'm here waiting for my possible condemnation to death. So what, uh, what, what gives? And philosophy's first response is, well, her first response as we've seen was, well, you're in good company. But the second response is, well, but wait a minute. You knew when you, was, when you started relying on fortune, when you started actually paying attention to things like power, and money and fame, you know, you're, you're, she will tell him later, your kids are doing, are still doing very well. You were one of the most envied people in Rome. It's like, well, that's fortune gave it to you. And you knew from the get go that for what fortune gives, fortune takes back. And uh, it does, she does, she can do that at any time. And she, uh, uh, she can do that for any reason. So why are you complaining? You got yourself into the, into that game. Right? You, you were after those things. And for a long time, you, you were, you know, fortune smiled on you. And it's not that she changed the rules of the game all of a sudden. You knew from the get go that those were the rules. Whatever she gives you, she may take away at any moment for any reason. So, there's, so she's not actually treating you unfairly, uh, as it turns out. From chapter three, um, for, uh, philosophy again says, uh, but you should not count yourself as wretched. Or have you forgotten the number and extent of your blessings? This is the first time that she has cast a malevolent, malevolent eye on you. Top up the number and extent of your happy days against the unhappy ones, and you cannot deny that your life up to now has been blessed. So this is essentially a follow-up uh, on, on, on the argument that you know, Fortune didn't take, didn't actually, did not actually treat Bush's uh, badly. In fact, I've read, uh, the, the bit I just read has another chunk that I skipped where she actually goes on and enlists the stuff that happened to Boisha that was granted to Boisha, uh, as I said, including, you know, not only power and money and, and uh, influence, but also a good family, 
uh, sons who themselves were powerful and uh, you know and, and rich. So it's like, what are you complaining about here? You know, most people will be envious for most of your life, and so like, there's really not much to complain. Chapter four, uh, in chapter four, uh, philosophy says, so why mortal men do you pursue happiness outside yourselves when it lies within? As long as you are in, common, in command of yourself, you will possess what you would never wish to lose and what fortune can never withdraw from you. So now she's moving from a, the specifics of Boish's situation to some more general uh, uh, sort of commentary on the human condition. And she asks, she rhetorically asks human beings, you know, people, why the hell are you pursuing happiness outside of yourselves as opposed to uh, within? Because true happiness for the philosopher, and particularly, again, this is a reference to the Stoics, um, true happiness actually uh, lies in, your, in, in, its, in, in yourself. Why? Well, that's because your virtue, your character, your judgments, all of those things are in fact up to you. And if you're content with, in, in your life to simply exercise your best judgment, to, uh, to uh, live virtuously, uh, then, uh, then nobody can actually uh, force you to do otherwise. Nobody can take virtue away from you. Seneca is very explicit in the letters to Lucilius. He says, you know, virtue is the only thing that nobody can take away from you, not even fortune, uh, right? Um, it's, it's entirely up to you. All of these other things, on the other hand, fortune can give you and fortune can, tell, can take away. And therefore, the problem with the human condition, according to Lady Philosophy here, is precisely that we have, we have misguided priorities. We, we go after the kind of things that, that put our happiness in the hands of fortune. Uh, and then we complain about it when, when she turns around. From uh, chapter six, still of book two, Philosophy says, high position does not confer honor on the virtues, rather virtue confers honor on high positions. And she also gives a number of other similar examples. You know, she says, uh, somebody's not an, a, a good man because he's rich, uh, he's a good man because he uses his riches well, his wealth well. Somebody's not a good man because he's educated, uh, somebody is a good man because he uses his education well and so on and so forth. In this particular case, she's talking, she's uh, about high position because of course, Boetius was in a very high position uh, within um, at, at court and within the Senate. So the point of course here is that all of these things that are bestowed on us from the outside, high position, wealth, etc., those are not valuable per se. They are preferred, they are, they are, they are to be preferred, as the Stoics would say, they are selectable, right? They, they are the kinds of things that it's perfectly fine to go after, so long as you don't stake your happiness on them. That's, that's the basic message here, right? It's okay to go and, and get educated and try to get some money, um, you know, power, influence, et cetera, et cetera, so long as you're doing that not because that's what makes you happy, you're doing that because you want to do the right thing. So that it's really entirely up to you how to use those things when you have them, right? So the good wealthy man is the, the man that uses his wealth in order to help others. The bad health wealthy man is the one that uses it to corrupt the political system and, and, and bring advantages to his own. That means that money per se or wealth per se is neither good nor bad, morally speaking. It's pre preferable, but it's not morally good or bad. What makes it morally good or bad is the way in which we act. And the same goes for everything else. This is essentially a Socratic argument. Socrates in the Eutydemus, uh, one of the Platonic dialogues, says explicitly this. He says that you know, the, the highest good or the chief good is virtue or wisdom. He uses the terms kind of interchangeably. And wisdom, of course, is one of the, the fundamental virtues. But more broadly is, the, is what, a, what uh, sort of all the virtues have in common. Right? Uh, so why is wisdom that is, is the chief good or the only true good? Well, that's because it's the only thing that can only be used for good. It's the only thing that allows you to do, you know, being, being a, a wise evil, in an evil way doesn't make any sense. It's an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. Wisdom can only be used for good. And wisdom is, in fact, precisely what tells you how to use everything else. Right? So that's why it's the, it's, the, it's the chief good for Socrates and for those like the cynics or the Stoics who followed him. And finally, from chapter seven of book two, and then I'll reopen the discussion, as I said, 
uh, the philosophy says, how many men highly famed in their own day have been expunged from our memory because the poverty of written records has brought oblivion? I ask you, what concern have they with reputation once their bodies have relaxed into death? This is almost straight out of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor philosopher, the philosopher uh, writes this kind of stuff very often in the meditations. He keeps uh, reminding himself, like, yeah, well, you know, everybody thinks about Alexander the Great, but where is he now? He's dead. Uh, he died at 32. And, uh, you know, everybody th thinks about Julius Caesar, but well, what is he now? Well, he, he got killed by his own friends and so on and so forth. What is the point of this? The point is to put things into perspective. It's like, you know, no matter how you struggle, we all have to die at some point. And so whether it is now because you've been put in prison by the, the following an injustice or it was a few years down the road, it doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. What does matter is what you did with your life for the period that you were in fact allowed to do something with your life. By the way, one could argue that Bush has used very well the last year of his life because up to that point, he had written other things he had been, as I said, influential in politics and a powerful man, etc. But everything that he, that he did in his life uh, was pretty much undone or, or forgotten about just a few years or a few decades after he died. The one thing that we still remember him for is the constellation of philosophy, which like, you know, 1500 years later, we still read and, and discuss uh, across the globe. So he obviously spent the last year in prison, very well, uh, last year of his life very well, and it turned out to be the one where he was in prison and, uh, you know, awaiting execution. So um, let's reopen the, the conversation here. Lawrence, uh, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Ms. Sure. Uh What's interesting, I thought, about this perspective from the classical, from the, uh, the classical world was that Aristotle and many of the Greeks from the classical period didn't think of happiness as necessarily depending on something which was immutable or permanent. They thought that your life, you know, was, was limited, but that right. it was subject to contingencies. Aristotle thought that wealth, you needed a certain amount of material wealth, a certain amount of prosperity. And Aristotle and also the Greek writers like Sophocles and Euripides thought your life really could be ruined by bad luck or misfortune. That your right. life was highly vulnerable and highly conditional. And I think part of it was that the Greeks didn't necessarily think that for something to be the source of happiness, it had to be permanent. I mean, and we recognize today that anything from musical performance to a piece of theater, to beautiful weather, to human life are transient. They're not permanent, but that doesn't mean that they can't make us very happy and they can't be yeah. a source of great happiness. But somehow Boethius really starts with an assumption that if something is transitory, uh, or kind of contingent, it's, uh, it's not worth it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's, a, that's an excellent observation. And so let me make a couple of points about this. So yes, he's, he's setting up the situation like this, but in the end, of course, by the end of the book, he will agree with philosophy that, uh, that in fact, you know, you, you, you could, you know, the, the, the thing that makes you happy is the only one that is under your control, that is virtue. Now, you brought up Aristotle, and that's an excellent point because Aristotle, of course, is the, classic point of reference when, he talk, when we talk about virtual ethics. All of these framework here that Boetius uses uh, is essentially a mix of virtual ethics and Christianity, right? And, and um, so Neoplatonism was a kind of virtual ethics as well. So was Aristotelianism, uh, Stoicism, Epicureanism. All of these were kind of virtual types of virtual ethics. But virtual ethics is really often sort of uh, uh, referred to as sort of an Aristotelian thing, even though it actually comes arguably from Socrates, not from Aristotle. The interesting thing, however, is that Aristotle did have actually is an interesting and different take from several of the other schools uh, about what makes you happy. So first of all, as we probably know, we'll probably know, it, the, the, the word that the Greeks used was eudaimonia, which is translated with as happiness in English only in a very clumsy fashion because it really doesn't mean happiness. Um, in the, there's no ancient text from which you, you read the context and say, oh yeah, they meant, he meant that. Um, it wasn't happiness. It was, it's often um, translated as flourishing, right? Whatever it makes for a flourishing life. And however, I actually have argued uh, in a couple of essays that uh, 
translating it that way kind of slants things in favor of Aristotle as, uh, as opposed to uh, some of the other Hellenistic schools. Because in, in, as a matter of fact, because as you pointed out, Aristotle says in order to achieve eudaimonia, you, de you definitely need virtue. You need to be a virtuous person because without it, you can't, you can't have it. But you also need a bunch of uh, you know, material things. Uh, and it does list things, you know, you need to be a little bit educated, uh, a little bit of wealth, uh, even a little bit of good looks. Otherwise, you know, your life is not, is not flourishing. However, that's Aristotle's specific take on eudaimonia. Um, one can make an argument that each one of the Hellenistic schools was actually differentiated precisely by how they interpreted eudaimonia. Uh, for, the, for the Epicureans, for instance, eudaimonia certainly included a, a component of virtue, but it also importantly included, uh, you know, was, was about uh, reducing pain and, and uh, seeking pleasure. For the Stoics, it was all about uh, virtue and for the cynics, the, the same. So the, broader, the broadest possible translation of eudaimonia that I can think of is the life worth living. And so if we think of eudaimonia, so the goal uh, is as the life worth living, then we can actually make sense of all the debates among the different schools, because what basically what ha was happening there is that they disagreed on what makes a, li a human life worth living. When Aristotle says you need virtue, but also you need certain uh, externals, he was obviously espousing a very commonsensical view of, of, uh, of uh, the life worth living, the flourishing life. Uh, when the Epicureans were saying, no, 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 you don't need a lot of externals. You, what you do need is to stay away from pain, particularly mental pain. Uh, they were to, looking at it differently. Their, their notion of the life worth re living was um, a life of at what they call ataraxia, which translates as tranquility of mind, right? Serenity. A life of serenity was, was what they were after. Uh, the Stoics uh, famously said one of the famous Stoic paradoxes was that um, uh, the sage, which is the ideal, the ideal Stoic, is happy, meaning eudaimon, even on the rack. That means even under torture. Now, if you translate eudaimonia as happiness, you must think that either these people were crazy or that they were masochists, right? Because nobody can possibly be happy or in fact even flourishing on the rack in, under torture. But what the Stoics meant, since the Stoics did uh, um, think that uh, eudaimonia was the life worth living, they thought, well, under certain extreme circumstances, it is worth the trouble to go you know, get tortured if in fact you're doing it for a good reason. If in fact you are uh, you know, defending your, your country or defending your friends or something like that, then you should endure tor even torture with a good spirit uh, because, in fact, your life is still worth living, even though, even though you are in that ex extreme uh, situation. Uh, let me see. Uh, is there any other comment before we move, move to book three? Okay, so let's move to book three. So here's uh, philosophy talking again. In their differing pursuits, men seek what is good, and this readily indicates the scope of nature's power. For though their aspirations vary and are at odds with each other, all are at one in choosing the good as their goal. Where is she getting here? She's saying that although we disagree on what, is, on what constitutes the good in life, and as I just said, you know, even the different schools of philosophy disagree, but certainly human beings in general disagree, we all agree that we want the good. Right? So we define, we conceive, we understand the good differently, but we all agree that we want the good. Nobody goes out saying, you know, I really want the bad stuff. Uh, you know, uh, she's, she's pointing this out because she's building an argument uh, with Boetius uh, toward something that we'll get to in, in, in a minute. So from chapter three, so first I inquire of you, and this is now Boetius talking, so first I inquire of you as one, uh, one who until recently possessed abundance of riches. When you had all that money, was there never a time when you were worried and this, actually, sorry, this is actually a philosophy talking. Uh, when you had all that money, was there never a time when you were worried and disturbed in mind through some, um, through some wrong you sustained? And Boisha says, I have to admit that I cannot recall ever feeling free from one worry or another. And philosophy says, so wealth cannot free, cannot free you from want and make you self-sufficient in spite of its apparent promise to do so. This comes after a bit 
where Boetius was saying, look, but, but you're, you're kind of poo-pooing the, the externals, you know, these, these, these things like money and power and everything. But in fact, people want them for a reason because they want to be independent. They want to be uh, happy. They want to be, you know, self-sufficient. And so basically she's going now here bit by bit. She's picking on each one of these uh, examples of externals that Boetius has brought up. And she says, but wait a minute, when you were powerful, were you actually serene? Were you actually happy? Or were you constantly afraid that somebody was going to try to trick you or trying to bring you down, which is, of course, what actually did happen to Boetius. And Boetius has to say, well, yeah, that's true. I did, you know, that, that was a, a constant worry. Well, when you were rich, when you were wealthy, you know, were you uh, content and secure and happy? Or were you worried that, you know, you might lose uh, your money, you might not be able to provide for your family and so on and so forth. And he says, well, yeah, and in, fa in fact, that was in fact kind of worried. So she's building this argument that despite their promise, externals are not bringing us happiness. They're understood as uh, in the eudaimonic sense of the term, because they actually don't bring you, uh, you know, the kind of security and self-sufficiency that uh, you think they might, they might bring you. And, um, and the next bit is, goes into a famous example. The next bit is from, uh, con uh, from chapter five of uh, the third book, and it continues, she's continuing, uh, philosophy is continuing the same argument. She says, that tyrant who had experienced the dangers of his station compared the fears felt by a king to the terror of a sword poised overhead. So what sort of power is it which cannot banish knowing anxieties or avoid the stinging pricks of fears? Kings themselves would prefer to live untroubled lives, but these they cannot do, so instead, they boast of their power. The tyrant in question that Lady Philosophy is referring to is uh, King Dionysius II of Syracuse, the same guy that Plato tried to, uh, um, to educate. Actually, I think I said, I said earlier uh, Dionysius I, but it was the second. And uh, Dionysius II was famous for this episode that is referred to as the Sword of Damocles. Uh, there was this... this uh, uh, you know, attendant of his or this, this friend of his, Damocles, who kept saying, you know, you must be great to be a king. You know, you, you're there on your throne and you, know, you can decide life and death uh, for everyone. And it's like, it's, you're great. It's, it's happy. You know, I, I wish I were your place. And uh, Dionysus, uh, despite his treatment of Plato, was actually kind of an interesting guy and says, well, let's, uh, let's, make, let's, make an, let's do an experiment here. I'm going to put you on the throne for a day. You, you'll be the king for just one day. You can do whatever you want. You can experience, you can have the full experience of being king. So Dumbledore says, wow, this is great. I, absolutely, I accept. And then he sits on the throne and he notices that right on top of his head, there is a sword dangling from, from the ceiling. And it's, it's dangling there by a thread. And the thread, it's obvious, could snap at any moment. And the, the, if it does, the, plunge will, will, the, the, the sword will plunge down and kill him. So he's, he's, he's getting a little nervous. He says to Dionysus, what the hell? What's going on here? I mean, there's this sword on the top of my head. And the king says, that's how I live my life. Every day I have a metaphorical sword that is hang, hanging on, on top of my head. Every day I could be killed. Every day I could cross somebody, even though I'm the king. And somebody might decide to do away with me. And even my power is limited. So I actually worry every day that something like that is going to happen, right? So that's, um, that's why Lady Philosophy here says kings themselves would prefer to live untroubled lives, but they, this they cannot do. So instead, they boast of their power. So, so all these boasting of power and richness and, and, you know, and all that sort of stuff, wealth and all that sort of stuff, is because they're actually afraid of their situation, but they have to somehow justify it first of, and foremost to themselves. Uh, that you know why they're there and why they keep doing what they're doing. So they say they keep telling all the rest of us about how great it is to be a king, but in fact it isn't that great. And we have the the um, other than Dionysus of Syracuse, uh, famous example uh, with the, the sword of Damocles. We have other examples of kings or emperors who actually have written uh, something along these lines. One of them is again Marcus Aurelius, and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, in the meditations, right, several times that, you know, he's, he's not very happy. He's not very uh, comfortable with court life. He, at, the, at some point, he actually tells himself, you know, as a Stoic, you know that you could live, you, 
if you have to, you can live anywhere, including even at court, meaning, meaning you know, this is definitely not his first choice. He wouldn't want to be there, but it has been entrusted on him. He has to do his duty. He sees that as, as a duty, so he's going to try to do his best, but it isn't, it isn't his choice. It is not the kind of thing that he would want to do otherwise. Uh, and then at the end, uh, near the end of the, uh, book three from chapter 10, I'm going to read one more uh, and then we're going to open again for a, a brief discussion if there is any comment. Since all things are sought to obtain the good, what all men desire is the good itself rather than the things which men seek. But we have already agreed that happiness is the reason for desiring all other things. And this makes it crystal clear that the substance of happiness and of the good itself is one and the same. So this whole book, essentially, book three, has been a long argument by philosophy to arrive at this conclusion that we just heard, uh, that the substance of happiness and of the good itself is one and the same. In other words, to be happy in the eudaimonic sense is to achieve the good. And the reason most people are not happy and not eudaimon is because they, are mis they misunderstand what the good is. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They are misleading, misled by others uh, into thinking that the good resides in the being wealthy or powerful and so on and so forth. And then they discover too late, uh, if they discover it at all, that that wasn't the case. So basically, this is a diagnosis of the human condition. Right? We have, everyone wants the good. Everyone wants a eudaimonic life. Everyone wants to be happy. It's just that most people are mistaken about what happiness is. So let me see, this is the end of book three. Let me see if there are comments uh, or questions about what we just, uh, what I just pointed out. Um, as I said, uh, uh, if uh, you guys are, have a, a question, you, you need to uh, raise your hand so that we can have it on audio video because I don't have, I cannot monitor the, the chat. So if you're asking questions in the chat, I'll get to that after the show is over, okay? So no questions about book three? All right, then we can go on to book four, which is the next to the last book uh, in the Constellation of Philosophy. From chapter one of book four, but the consuming cause of my depression, says uh, Boetius, is this, that in spite of the existence of a good ruler over the world, it is, all, it is at all possible for evils to exist or to go unpunished. Now, now here is turning toward the Christian uh, attitude, right? So he's saying, all right, there is a ruler of the universe and this ruler of the universe is good and all that sort of stuff. So how come that there is evil? And this is the famous problem of theodicy, which has, take, which has kept, of course, uh, Christian theologians occupied from then until now. Um, nobody's been able to particularly, you know, to solve the, the problem. But there are some interesting things that Boetius uh, has Lady Philosophy say about the problem of theodicy in book four. So we're going to go through them uh, little by little. In chapter two, the, uh, the word is back to philosophy. So philosophy talks and she says, why is it that they abandon virtue and, and pursue vices? They mean people. Is it because they do not recognize things that are good? If so, what is more effect than, than the blindness of ignorance? But evil men, you will say, have power. I will not deny this myself, but their power stems not from their strength, from, but from their weakness. This is the, interesting, um, the first interesting sort of rebuttal that philosophy has for the, the, the objection that Boetius has, has brought up, that you know, but evil people seem to do well. Interesting that is, yes, they're, they're doing well. She said, you know, I'm not denying the fact, but in fact, this is, they're doing well is an illusion and it's a result of their weakness, not of their strength. Why not? Because they're weak in, in character, right? Their character is weak uh, because they don't seek virtue. They don't exercise virtue. So they're, they're weak in character. They're defective in character. And she will elaborate uh, in, in, a, in a minute on what that means. Uh, but I want to point out that this also is a Socratic idea, which was then uh, elaborated uh, more in detail by the Stoics, this notion that bad people do things, do evil things out of uh, weakness or lack of wisdom, not because they actually think, they actually want to do uh, those kinds of things. They think that they're doing the right thing. They think that they rationalize it. Um, they rational, rationalize what they do, but that's just because they're sick. Uh, remember the analogy between the doctor and the patient uh, early on, and she's gonna turn back to turn to this um, argument in a minute. 
So in chapter three, she says, no outsider's wickedness can pluck from honest hearts the glory that is theirs. Now, if a person derives that glory from an external source, some other person would say, even the, the donor himself could deprive him of it. But since it is bestowed on the individual by his own worth, he will forego his reward only when he ceases to be good. He says, look, if, if honors are given to you from the outside, from, the, from, from somebody else, by somebody else, then somebody else, that somebody else has power over you because you could take the honors away, right? Or wealth or whatever else. But if it comes from inside, if it comes from you, then nobody can take, can, can take it away. And uh, this, is, this is a notion that we find very strongly in Epictetus. Epictetus says that the, um, the essence of human freedom is precisely to be free of, the, uh, of owing things to people that have power over us. So he, sa he says in the, in the discourses several times, you know, if, he, if you're going after uh, glory or money or whatever, then you are the slave, you are a willing slave of whoever has the power to grant you those things. And that's not a good life, according to, uh, at least according to Epictetus, and apparently according to Boethius as well. Still from chapter three, uh, philosophy says, just as goodness itself becomes the reward for good men, so wickedness itself is the punishment for bad men. By resorting to wickedness, wickedness, they have lost their human nature as well. Again, this is a recurring theme in Seneca who uh, tells you that, look, uh, when, you, when you do bad things, when you act contra to uh, human reason and human sociality, sociability, uh, you're losing yourself. And the first person you, dam you damage to is yourself okay? because you're damaging your character, you're damaging your own, your own judgment. And because your character is the most important thing you, do, you, you have, and on top of which it is under your control because you can work on it, by doing bad things, you damage your own character. You, the first person you do damage is yourself uh, before even, even uh, you do damage to other people. And this bit about human nature is interesting because it's reminiscent uh, uh, of uh, Epictetus, who says in the discourses that when people do bad things, they act as animals, as, uh, as either wild beasts or sheep, he says. Wild beasts, uh, when they act violently and when they do uh, bad things out of, you know, out of uh, malice, and uh, sheeps when they don't reason correctly and they act at random. And uh, what Epictetus says is a, a human being, a good human being, a true human being, is somebody who does not act either as a sheep or as a wild beast. In other words, is somebody who acts with reason, and reason is the same as virtue, as, uh, as Seneca says, and what that means is that reason tells you that human beings should help each other, not destroy each other. We are in one big boat together, the, the human cosmopolis, the, the entire, the, the big city of all human beings. And we are essentially social animals, cooperative animals, uh, that we're here to help each other. If you don't understand that, that's how you lose your way. And then you start, you start uh, in fact, um, uh, doing damage, first and foremost, to yourself. In chapter four, uh, still a book four, uh, philosophy says, what follows from this is that there is no place whatever for hatred in the minds of the wise. Only another idiot would hate good men, and it is irrational to hate the wicked. For if vice is a species of mental disease comparable to illness in the body, since we regard those who are physically ill as wholly undeserving of hatred and deserving greater of pity, then men with minds oppressed by wickedness, a condition more dreadful than any sickness, should all the more be pitied rather than, than hounded. This is pure Epictetus. Um, Epictetus has a um, bit in the, uh, in, the, in the discourses where he says, uh, wicked men are like blind men. They're sick, okay? Their soul is sick. And how do you treat a blind man? Uh, you don't beat him up because he's blind. You don't criticize him because he's blind because that's not, it's not his fault. He's blind. He's sick. What you do is you make sure that he doesn't hurt other people by just blundering around, blundering around and doesn't hurt himself. So it's, it's, uh, the notion here is not to be quietest about injustice. 
right? You should, according both to the Stoics and, and to, to uh, Boetius here, you should intervene if you're seeing injustice and if it is in your power, because you don't want people to get hurt. You want people to be treated fairly. However, you, shouldn't, you should not hate the perpetrator of injustice because he's just sick. He's, he's like, you should treat him as a blind man. You should have pity for him, uh, not, not hatred. This, obviously, is not that different from the uh, Christian message of, you know, hate the sin, but not the sinner. Right? It's the act that needs to be stopped. It's the act that needs to be countered. But the human being himself, he's just unwise. He just doesn't know better. He doesn't, you know, as Jesus says on the cross, right? Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, that's the same, the same attitude that we have here. And of course, it's not surprising in, uh, in Boetius, who was also a Christian, but this particular example, this particular reasoning actually comes straight from Epictetus, who obviously was not a Christian. Chapter six in book four, uh, this is philosophy talking again. Providence is the divine reason itself, established within the highest originator of all things, who disposes them all, whereas fate is the order imposed on things that change through which providence interlinks each and every object in their due arrangement. So the conversation now is shifted to the question of providence. And the reason um, Boetius, Boetius is asking here is because he raises another interesting, important problem that the Christians and, and as well as pre-Christian philosophers had to deal with, and we're still dealing with it now, which is, if there is providence, if God knows everything that is going to happen at all times, then there is no free will, or there would appear that there is no free will. And so everything that we do, it's kind of, it's nonsense. It's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not our fault if we do things. And so to punish the wicked is in fact, not, it's nonsensical. It's, it's in fact, it's monstrous uh, because they are not in control. They're not in charge of what they're doing. Right? So, so uh, Boetius here is raising that issue and that's where they get to a discussion of providence versus, uh, versus fate. And here philosophy says, well, providence is God's plan, God's big plan. Fate is how the plan gets implemented at an individual level or at a specific level, okay? So what we call fate uh, is the way in which providence unfolds. Now, you don't have to believe in God in the Christian sense in order to, uh, to present this kind of you know, view of things. The Stoics did not believe in God in that sense. The Stoics believed that God is the universe itself, the, the nexus of the cosmic cause, uh, uh, web of cause and effect. Even, though, even, even so, they, they did talk about fate and providence, and they talked about it in, this, in the, kind of the same way. Uh, providence is the big picture of what happens in the, in the universe, and fate is what happens within that big picture. The big picture to individual human beings. Continuing, uh, I have two more quotes in chapter six of book four, and then we're gonna pause again for if there are, to see if there are questions. And this, in, in the next two quotes, philosophy again elaborates on, the, on this issue. So although the general picture may seem to you mortals, one of confusion and turmoil, because you're totally unable to visualize these order of things, all of them nonetheless have their own pattern, which orders them and directs them towards the good. So philosophy here is saying, look, of course you guys don't understand what's going on here. You're finite, you know, very small, very localized human beings. Your lifespan is short. Your, your, your horizon of over, uh, you know, view of things is very limited. So of course you don't get the big picture. But if you could, if you did have, have sort of the God's eye view, then actually all of this would not look at all by, a, by all of this, she means life uh, and everything that happens would not appear to be random. We're not, we're not appear to be just one damn thing after another. It would appear to be the result of providence in the case of sort of Christians or in the case of the Stoics, it would appear to be the result of uh, you know, necessity, cause and, cause and effect. And then near the end of chapter six of book four, she says, to some men, providence assigns varied fortunes appropriate to the nature of their minds. Others, she stings from time to time to ensure that they do not degenerate through continuing prosperity. To others, she gives a hard time to allow them to strengthen their qualities of mind by the application and exercise of patience. So this is an argument that you find in the, um, in the Hellenistic philosophers, some of the Hellenistic philosophers, and then uh, the Christians really run, run with it. Essentially, when bad things happen to good people, that's because it's a test, right? Uh, so God is testing you. God is, is making sure that you are prepared 
uh, for you know for the various challenges of uh, that life throws at you, and so that is the Christian sort of rationalization of why good things so sort of bad things happen to good people. Now the Stoics had a similar notion, except that in their case it was more a matter of endurance. The emphasis was on enduring. So Marcus Aurelius says that life is more like a wrestler, uh, like wrestling, than like, like dancing, because. Fortune sends you stuff. It's like a, it sends you opponents that are that are meant to keep you in good shape, and so you constantly have to be on guard because your next opponent is coming from any any anywhere, and uh, and at any time, right? And in the Stoics, there is no notion that this is actually part of a bigger plan. It's just what happens because that's the way the universe works. Um, but nevertheless, there is this same kind of basic idea that um, you should welcome. Uh, uh, you know, bad things happening or, or setbacks or, or uh, things that are, are not going to be uh, feeling very pleasant because, first of all, that's just life, right? It's a, it's a mortal, con mortal condition. We all die at some point. We all lose loved ones at some point and so on and so forth. So setbacks are kind of part of life. But also because, in fact, you could turn those around and think of those as... Um, um, instead of as catastrophes, as opportunities for you to engage, uh, opportunities for you to practice your virtue. This is inc incidentally a um, concept that is actually being used uh, by modern psychologists. It's called the framing effect. You, know, you can look at the same exact thing, the same exact facts in life very differently. You can, uh, as cognitive behavioral therapists, you can catastrophize things. You know, if something happens, oh, there is a there's a pandemic and I'm supposed to be inside. Now I'm inside, you know, this is day number 56 for me. And I could react by saying, this is a catastrophe. This is a horrible thing. This is the worst thing that ever happened. That would not help at all. In fact, it would make things worse because on top of the actual problem, now you have your own attitude that it's not particularly positive. Or you could say, oh, I see what the, the universe is doing here. They're sending me a challenge. And so let me see how I can do with this challenge. Fine. I'm stuck here, day number 56. How can I use the time well? Well, how about I start a worldwide philosophy book club so that I meet people that I never met before and I have a chat for an hour and a half about some of the best works in, 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 uh, in philosophical literature, right? So that's the way to, to uh, react to the situation and that's exactly what uh, Fortuna, uh, sorry, what uh, uh, philosophy is telling uh, Boetius. So I'm gonna stop here for a second before we get to the final book, book five. Let me see if there are any comments or any questions? You guys are almost as quiet as my students at City College. I mean, there is uh, there's 42 of you, actually 41 of you, and yet, so far I only got three or four questions. Okay, fine. I'm okay with that. I'm all right. Okay, I guess I'm gonna to proceed to book five, which is the last one, and hopefully that's gonna generate some discussion because it's gonna, it, it, it contains a, an old chestnut and, a, and, a, and one surprising uh, sort of concept position by Lady Philosophy uh, that we might want to discuss. And then after that, we're gonna just wrap it up. So from chapter one, philosophy says, if one were to define chance as the outcome of a random movement which interlocks with no causes, I should maintain that it does not exist at all, that it is a wholly empty term denoting nothing substantial. Whenever something is done with a particular purpose in mind, philosophy says, and as a result of certain causes, something other than uh, was intended occurs, it is called chance. So she's denying the existence of chance. Chance does not exist uh, because what happens is everything that happens is the result of previous causes. Of course, that's the story take or is the result of, of, uh, of you know, divine providence, but nothing happens by chance. And when we use the word chance, when we say, you know, it's not happened by chance, it's simply because we don't have a grasp of all of the causes that are underlying certain phenomena, right? And we know from modern science that that is in fact the case, uh, right? Let's, without going into discussions of quantum mechanics and whether, whether the quantum level phenomena are really indeterminate or not, let's forget that for a minute because that will give us, you know, lead us too far afield. But let's take a, a mundane example. We uh, did the classic example of a random event is the flipping of a coin, right? In fact, we, we decide, when we want to decide uh, on, 
amount between two outcomes uh, that we really have no preference, no particular preference for, what we do, we, we flip a coin, right? Uh, because we assume that that's the quintessential random event. But of course it isn't. Uh, if you had, and this has been demonstrated uh, with computer simulations very exhaustively, if we have enough information about the size of the, of the coin, the weight of the coin, uh, the uh, force that is being applied to the coin when you flip it, the friction in the air, and so on and so forth, you will be able to predict exactly what ha what's going to happen, whether it's going to be tail or, or head. There's no chance involved at all. So what we call chance is, is simply our own epistemic ignorance. It's epistemic limitations. We don't, as philosophers would say, we just don't have enough information to figure out what's going to happen, and therefore we call it chance. This is exactly what Boetius has philosophy say there, which is a pretty interesting sort of take for, for 1,500 years ago. She goes on and says uh, in chapter two, there is free will, for no rational nature could exist if it did not possess freedom of will. What can by uh, its nature deploy reason possesses the judgment by which to discern each and everything, and thus unaided it, it distinguishes it, what must be avoided from what is desirable. Now, this is an interesting concept of free will, however, that we are presented here. She's saying, she's calling it free will. She's using the word free will here, uh, which of course, it's, it's actually a Christian word. Um, the earlier philosophers didn't use free will. They used different words. The Stoics, for instance, used the prohiresis, which is Greek for what we would call volition, the ability to make decisions. And that is exactly how philosophy is defining free will here. She's not talking about, you know, so contra-causal free will, you know, free will without causes. She's saying every reasonable creature has the means to understand what he or she should do or should not do, and therefore, and follows through uh, accordingly. So she's really talking about our ability to make decisions, okay? And she says, of course we have, you have reason, so you can make decisions. And you can think about those decisions, and you can make these decisions in a, in a concerted, you know, uh, well thought out way. From chapter three, there seems to be a considerable contradiction and inconsistency, says Boetius, between God's foreknowing of all things and the existence of any free will. So now he goes back to, it's like, okay, that now they talked about providence and free will and all that sort of stuff. And then he says, yeah, but I'm still not convinced. It seems to me that there is a contradiction here between the notion of free will on the one hand and the notion of foreknowledge, you know, God, God knowing, knowing everything on the other hand. If he knows everything, then the then, then I'm obviously, in a sense, not free to do what I want because I'm going to do whatever God already knows I'm going to do. In chapter four, she says, philosophy says, I wish to know why you regard as ineffectual the argument of those who try to solve the problem. So she's actually reminding him that people have already resolved that problem that he's talking about. And here's the solution. They, these, these philosophers, think that foreknowledge is not by necessity the cause of future events. And so they believe that freedom of the will is not hindered by such foreknowledge. It is surely not the case that the sole basis on which you argue for the necessity of future events is that things foreseen cannot fail to happen. She says, look, you're confusing two different things here. Um, just because somebody's able to make predictions, um, you know, even very certain predictions, and this there's somebody, of course, being God, that doesn't mean you don't have a choice. It just means that he, he, he's figured out what you're going to do. And um, she uses an interesting example there, a, a spatial one. She, um, not in the book that I, that I just read, but she says, um, so imagine that you're seeing somebody walking on, on the other side of the street, right? Uh, you can see exactly where he's going and you, ex you see exactly what he's doing. And you can even make a very good prediction about, you know, now he's crossing the street and now he's turning that way and so on and so forth. But that doesn't compel that person to do what he's doing. He's doing it on his own volition. The fact that you have knowledge because you have a particular vantage point of what he's doing doesn't compel him to do this thing or that other, right? So what she's saying is, and she'll get to that in a minute, I'll read you this specific quote because this is kind of surprising. When I read that, it kind of blew my mind. Um, she's saying, God has the same view of time that we have of space. The same way in which you see somebody, you, can, you see exactly what somebody's doing, and that doesn't mean you're controlling them. It doesn't mean that they're not doing things that they want to do. God sees time in the same way. Think about it. This, this is kind of mind-blowing. So she says, um, chapter 6, 
And this is uh, the last quote that I'm going to bring up. So what does rightly claim the title of eternal is that which grasps and possesses simultaneously the entire fullness of life without end. No part of the future is lacking, in, lacking to it, and no part of the past has escaped it. It must always appear to itself as in the present and as governing itself. She's talking about God. The unending course of fleeting time it must possess as the here and now. So God is, it turns out to be a Trafalmadorian. If you've read um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel, uh, uh, Slaughterhouse Five, uh, it's, a science, it's, also, it's also in part a science fiction story where the Trafalmadorians are these uh, alien beings that kidnap the major character, the two major characters and put them in a zoo because they want to, they're, they're amused by human beings. The Trafalmadorians have this really interesting uh, uh, ability. They can see time in the same, they can perceive time in the same way in which we, we perceive space which means that they see the, their entire life. They, they see themselves as a four dimensional being with these, all these time slices, basically, from when they were born to when they die. And it's an interesting uh, uh, you know, ability because the Tafamadorians use it to spend more time, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, to focus on those bits of, this, of those uh, time slices where they actually had interesting or good experiences and they don't dwell too much on the time slices where they don't have uh, very good experience, but they can see the whole thing simultaneously. Essentially, later philosophy is presenting this kind of, uh, of notion. And the reason this blew my mind is because if you think about it, this is uh, precisely what a lot of physicists are suggesting today, we should think about time. The famous block universe model that comes from general relativity tells you exactly this, that time exists simultaneously with space. Time is simply a dimension of space an additional dimension together with space of space time and we perceive uh, past and future um, because we're finite human being, be beings and it's a psychological perception but it's ultimately an illusion according to general relativity if we could perceive the entire block universe we would see time the same way in which we see space and therefore everything that happened in the past is still there and happen, everything that is going to happen in the future is also still there. And you could turn around and look at the future and the past just in the same way in which you look ahead of you or behind you uh, in a spatial dimension. Now, let me make clear that I'm not suggesting that Boethius has arrived at general theory of relativity here. This is not at all what I'm saying. But it is really interesting to me that this is the conception of time that he came up with. And this is his way to resolve what was a big issue at the time and, and kept being a big issue throughout the intervening 15 uh, centuries, uh, this notion that, you know, how can God have foreknowledge and we still have free will? Well, because God is a, is a Tafamadorian. Uh, God sees the block universe. God sees time, perceives time exactly in the same way in which we perceive space. And so it's no mystery that you can see ahead and, and, and further back uh, and yet that doesn't deny the fact that we are making decisions right here, right now. Okay, so, so that was my summary of Boish's Constellation of Philosophy. Let's see if there are any last minute questions, either on the fifth book or on anything that we've discussed so far. And I do have uh, somebody, David, go for it. Oh, yes. There Hi there. Go. Oh, there we go. Cool. Yep. Um, Sorry, so one, I was not expecting to hear the phrase, God is a Trophimadorian <laughs> when joining this <laughs> meeting today. So thank you for that. Sure. Uh, and uh, um, one thing, and it's actually something I've just kind of been thinking through as you've been speaking um, on some of the chapters, is um, kind of going back to book four, uh, you know, chapter two, when you're talking about, um, you know, how power you know, other people's power stems from their own weakness, you know, as far as those people who, um, you know, embrace vice. And I, I guess thinking on that, you know, eternal, you know, external sources and your own personal happiness, you know, I guess if that's a Venn diagram, you know, there shouldn't be any meeting in between, right? Um, yeah. But at the same time, it sounds like the, I don't know, the right thing to value um is to do the good right so you know the desire to do the good 
you know, it re- kind of relies on external circumstances to be able to do good in some senses. Um, so I guess, how do you get out of the, I don't know if it would technically be a paradox, but how do you get past right. the the roadblock of you try to do good, but then you are prevented from doing that. And so because you're prevented and your happiness is coming from doing good, uh, it's ultimately still relying on external circumstances um, for your own happiness. Right. Oh, that's a, that's an excellent question. So, uh, and there are different answers depending on which Hellenistic school you're looking at. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two, right, which I sort of outlined earlier. But we're gonna get a little bit more detail here. One is Aristotle, the other one is the Stoics. So Aristotle will say, in answer to your question, it's not possible if you don't have certain externals that you can exercise, you know, your virtue on. You're screwed. That's it. Uh, you're done. And uh, you know, no eudaimonia for you, my friend. <laughs> And in fact, Aristotle went even so far as to say that a person never actually knows if he has achieved eudaimonia, the only, because you have to wait until the end of your life to figure it out. Because something may end, uh, uh, come up, end up horribly wrong right at the end of your life, or even immediately after your death, in fact. Uh, you know, your reputation can be destroyed by the fact that uh, somebody discovers something about you that nobody knew, and then your eudaimonia goes down the drain even after your death. So technically, for Aristotle, uh, you never know. You do need those externals. And in fact, only your posterity can tell whether you were you diamond or not. The Stoics had a radically different answer to that question. For the Stoics, uh, happiness or eudaimonia was not, did not consist in actually doing good, but in the, uh, in the will to do good, right? So in other words, to exercise virtue. Whether you could exercise it or not, depending on, your, on the external circumstances. And if the external circumstances are favorable, of course, you can exercise virtue. But even if the external circumstances are not favorable, you can still exercise virtue. Um, I mentioned earlier the, 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 the sage on the rack, but let me give you a modern example of somebody who doesn't actually, uh, did, did not actually con- uh, think of himself as a Stoic, but was influenced by the Stoics, as it turns out, specifically by Marcus Aurelius, and that's uh, Nelson Mandela. So even if Mandela, the Stoics would say that even if Mandela had not gone, never gotten out of prison, died in prison, uh, you know, which he spent number, a good number of years there. But let's say that he died in prison and, and uh, uh, South Africa still had apartheid when he, when, he, when he died, at the time he died. For the Stoics, his life was still, still counts as eudaimonic. And the reason for that is because he was doing the right thing. He was, he was doing whatever he could, right? even from prison, even just withstanding torture and talking to his, to his, his jailer, uh, he was doing what he could and he was setting the example. Epictetus explicitly says, he mentions one of the, uh, the, the Stoic senators who died in the middle of the Stoic opposition that I mentioned earlier. And one of his students says, well, so what good did he do? You know, it, the guy's dead. So, so he opposed, uh, you know, Vespasian, but then, then he was killed. So what, what good does that do? And Epictetus' response is, the same good that the purple does to the, to the toga. The purple makes the toga more interesting. It stands out, right? And so you give the good example so the next generation or somebody else is going to follow through and is going to try to do good. So for the Stoics, you can actually exercise virtue almost under any circumstances. And I say almost, you know, including, as I said, torture. But I say almost because they do make an exception. And, and they're very clear about this exception. They said that there are some certain situations where you actually are incapable of exercising even virtue. And those are situations where you are so physically and especially mentally frail that you cannot do anything anymore, right? And there are cases of Stoics who got to that point. One of them was actually Zeno of Sadium, the founder of Stoics. At that point, Epictetus and Seneca are both very clear on what you should do. Uh, they put it differently. For Epictetus, you should walk out of the, of the open door. For Seneca, you should cut the knot. Um, basically, what they're saying is you should commit suicide. Right? If you get to the point in life where you really absolutely cannot do anything permanently, there is nothing because your, your mind is, is going, your physical situation is such that you're completely dependent on other people and you can't do anything, then that is the time to walk out of the door. Um, Epictetus says the, the room is smoky, get out. But that's an extreme situation, which you should consider very carefully. And unless you get to that extreme point, 
then you should stay. You have a duty to stay. And if you have a duty to stay, then you have to exercise your, your virtue. Okay. Uh, Daniel, you are next. And hopefully, Hi. yes. Daniel, go Hi. ahead. So uh, in your chapter six notes, you write, God is, is a Trifalmadorian, that is, he perceives the block universe. Problem is that assumes determinism. So yeah. it seems a little counterintuitive to me that determinism would be a functional notion in a block universe. Do you see it otherwise? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, as I said, I don't want to go too far in that direction because it's not about physics. But no, I actually don't see that as a contradiction at all. As it turns out, you know, modern physics, with one caveat that I'm going to bring up in a minute, does see the universe as deterministic. And in fact, particularly the block universe is a deterministic universe. Uh, general relativity is a deterministic uh, theory in physics. The caveat is, as I mentioned earlier, quantum mechanics, right? Quantum me the status of quantum mechanics is not clear. We, we do know that quantum mechanics is in some sense at odds with general relativity. So one or the other is right. Possibly both are incomplete and wrong. And that's why physicists are looking, I've been looking for a number of years now, decades, I should say, for a more fundamental physics, that, that, that theory that will reconcile the two or supersede the two. As far as quantum mechanics is concerned, the problem is I understand it, and you know, don't quote me, I know this is gonna be on YouTube in a few minutes, in, in a few hours, but don't quote me because I'm not a physicist. But my physicist friends tell me that um, the problem with quantum mechanics is that the status is uncertain because the equations that actually make up the theory are deterministic. Uh, there's, there's no random chance, there's no random element at all in the, in the equations themselves. However, the experimental results seem to indicate, uh, for, in, for instance, about atomic decay and things like that, seem to indicate that the phenomena being described by quantum mechanics are in fact fundamentally random. They're fundamentally non-deterministic, right? So which one is it? Is it gonna be, is, it, is the universe deterministic or is it in fact fundamentally, uh, at a fundamental level, non-deterministic and then deterministic kind of emerges as an emergent property? Because nobody doubts that classical physics is deterministic. The example that I gave of the flipping of a coin, there's no question there. There's, there's no issue with quantum mechanics. It's, it's deterministic. And of course, we live in, in the microscopic universe. We're only indirectly affected by quantum phenomena. Therefore, for us, the, there's no question that the universe, universe also is deterministic. Whether it's deterministic at the foundational level or not, I understand it's still an open question. And, and it will depend on which shape the next fundamental theory uh, will take, whether it's going to be string theory or M theory or uh, loop quantum gravity or whatever the hell else the, the, the physicists are going to invent next. Uh, so that is an open question. Of course, from a philosophical perspective, both um, the, um, the, the, the people actually believe in free will and are still determinists, those are the so-called compatibilists, and the Stoics were among uh, what we will consider today compatibilists. Well, those people will tell you that determinism is necessary for volition is necessary for us to make decisions because uh, if, if uh, the universe were actually uh, in a place where things happen at random, then we wouldn't be making our decisions. We'd just be making random decisions. We'd be like flipping the coin continuously uh, instead of actually making our decisions. So our decisions wouldn't be ours. But as I said, you know, this is as far as I'm gonna go with this uh, today. We got a few more minutes and I have Bobby next. Yes. Hi. So when you mentioned Nelson Mandela, um, you talked about how even if he, um, you know, he, he stays in prison his whole life, um, apartheid, you know, never goes away. Um, well, then he's still making an example for the next person, right? But what I was thinking right. was, okay, kind of how, uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, no one's around to hear it, it doesn't make sound. If someone... Uh, suffers for a good cause in a forest and no one is ever around to discover that person suffering is that person doing good as an end in itself still within the realm of uh, the stoic conception of virtue ethics that is a great question and if, if you, i think we're going to close on that one it's, it is a great question now obviously that person is not doing any good for other people um and that's unfortunate <laughs> obviously however according to the stoic conception he's still doing good for himself because he's, not, he's still, even at the end, even in the end, when he's dying in prison or under torture and there is nobody that's listening to him and there is no, no benefit that's going to come out of to other people of, those, of what, is, what is happening there, 
he is still a person of integrity. He still can say to himself, you know, this is unjust, but the world works this way. I am still not caving in. I am still doing what is the right thing, even though it's not going to have consequences outside of this, of this particular room. That is one reason, uh, you know, people may or may not buy, of course, this, this, this version of things. But that is one thing, one, one, one reason I find uh, Stoicism so consoling in the sense of Boish's consolation of philosophy, uh, right? Because even under those extreme conditions, which let's be frank, most of us will never experience, right? Hopefully most of us are not even going to get tortured by somebody, um, let alone not only torture, but in complete isolation with nobody knowing, knowing what's going on. That's, that's a very unusual situation. But even under those conditions, the Stoic would say, well, you know what? You still did your best. Your best. You still can say, all right, I did not come in. I did not give the tyrant what he wanted. I, I, I did not uh, you know, facilitate uh, bad things happening. Uh, so that's, to me, that's, 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 that's pretty good. That's important. Um, all right, people, we are at the end of this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. For, uh, I hope you enjoyed the reading and the discussion of uh, Boisha's Consolation of Philosophy. As a reminder, next month, we are discussing uh, uh, Albert Camus, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. And uh, for that particular occasion, I will be joined by my good friends and colleagues, Sky Cleary and, and Jamie Lombardi. And then after that, in July, uh, we're going to discuss Frankenstein as a science, the first modern science fiction novel uh, that has plenty of philosophical uh, implications. So I look forward to that. If you want to start reading the books now, go ahead. And if you want to have access to the notes for this particular conversation, as well as to the dates for the uh, upcoming conversations, then just uh, go to the meetup.com um, meetup and look for uh, Philosophy Book Club. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next month. Uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.